Welcome back to Warhammer Lore. In today's video, we will be once again digging into the gluttonous ogre kingdoms. This time, however, focusing on the more religious aspect of their culture and, of course, the Great Maw. As usual, all the information for this video is being pulled from the latest army books, the Warhammer Fantasy Roleplay, and the Warhammer Fantasy Novels. And with that out of the way, clear your table, prepare your best noblar, as we delve into the Great Maw of the Ogre Kingdom. In order to explain the Great Maw, we will need to retread some history we covered in our society video. The time in particular is the catastrophe that was the birth of the insatiable god of the Ogre Kingdoms. The Ogres were a thriving race after the enactment of the Great Vortex, and could be found in the steppes and mountainous regions near the far eastern kingdom of Cathay whom they had relatively good relations with, as they were often employed as bodyguards and shock troops by the local men. However, even at this time, the ogres had an ever-present hunger, and with their growing numbers, were running out of food and land to sustain their nation. This led to raiding, pillaging, and eating of thy neighbor, as the ogres found the men of Cathay to be weak, and what little truce was present between the two nations quickly evaporated. However, what happened next is up for debate, as through either an act of fate or the will of the Dragon Emperor, the men of Cathay were delivered from their attackers without having to put up much resistance against their once allies. Of course I am talking about the massive chunk of warp stone that fell from the sky. It has been said that this comet may have been a fractured piece of the Chaos Moon Morsleb that just happened to fall at the exact moment. But it is also speculated that the Dragon Emperor and the sorceress astromancers that he employs may have brought this calamity upon the Ogres themselves. Of course, there's also the possibility that the great changers of ways, Zinch, with his far-flung schemes, guided this destruction in this exact moment, possibly thwarting a greater threat to chaos down the road. Or maybe it was simply a result of the ogre ever-present and growing hunger that birthed this destruction straight from the warp, as their belief and desires manifested it in the actual world. It would not be the first time belief had done so, as the elves have used a similar method, though obviously in a much more controlled manner, to manifest their own gods to battle their enemies long ago. Then again, it simply makes too much sense to me that this has to be the work of the Dragon Emperor, which does give some of our very limited insight into the country of Cathay itself and the ancient powers they seem to possess. As this one act both saved their country from a drawn out war and annihilated their enemy to a point that the ceased to be a threat. Regardless of which outcome is true, if not more than one, the Comet of Warpstone landed in the center of the Ogre homeland. The impact alone killed two-thirds of the population, and the raging storm that followed of fire and death both destroyed the land itself and all of the herds and beasts the Ogres had relied on for the majority of their food. This quickly led to a power struggle amongst the surviving Ogres, and of the survivors, many were cannibalized to feed the strong further warping and twisting the Ogre society to the one we recognize to this day. In addition to these hardships, an even greater gluttonous desire was awakened within the Ogres themselves, and the need to gorge and feed was all-consuming. But with the land now barren and the land of Cathay sheltered by the storms raging from the comet, the Ogres were forced to travel into unfamiliar land, and the migration nature of the tribes was thus born. Though there are tales told by the ogres that speak of Groth Onefinger, the leader of his tribe, that decided to visit and appease the new hungry god before leaving the lands of their people. The journey was perilous, and never before seen monsters and beasts now plagued the land, in addition to raging cyclones, and of course, the scorched earth. After enduring these hardships like only an ogre could, they began to approach the crater. Suddenly, the wind changed, and what was once a raging wind buffeting them from multiple angles instead began to pull them toward the massive hole in the earth. 
It took every ounce of their thick, superhuman muscles not to be pulled into the chasm. For on hands and knees, Groth and his tribe were able to peer down into the pit. It appeared to have no bottom, and was as wide as some of the many seas a few of the traveling ogres had described. Though it was entirely empty, blackness. With the exception from the massive rows upon rows upon rows of jagged, enlarged teeth and flexing, wriggling muscles that stretched down the edge of this chasm into nothingness. This was the ogre's god made manifest, a bottomless gullet incapable of being filled and desperate to feed and consume everything around it. It is very possible that many of the ogres simply threw themselves into the chasm after losing their minds, or being pulled by the deity that calls to the all ogres to this day towards its hungry mouth. Only Groth and a few survivors managed to flee this place and return to the remainder of the tribes and spread this tale of what is now known as the Great Maw and in doing so have kept this god fed by both the sacrifice of their kind and the worship of now the tribes. As we know that to worship in the Warhammer world is to give power to a belief and make it a real in a sense. So regardless if Groth One Finger was being truthful or not, as some have speculated, if you were to travel to the heart of the former Ogre Kingdoms, you would find this god both present and very very hungry, which may in fact reflect the hunger all ogres feel as they can never be satiated much like their deity. For this reason all ogres would be considered religious as they both sacrifice and appease the two sole deities of their race regardless of where in the world they may find themselves. These gods of course are the malevolent great Ma itself and its lesser spawn, the Firemouth. A smaller following amongst the tribes, but still a god feared and appeased by many clans. All gods in Warhammer have a particular way in which they are worshipped, and the gods of the ogres are no different. The Great Maw demands sacrifices of food, and is worshipped by the consuming of meat and great feasts, amongst blood sports and many other tasks of which many are made in the ogre tribes to both mark holidays and great events, and of course to appease their god. So you see, the actual act of eating for an ogre is a form of worship, and for this reason the Great Maw is both a powerful and terrible force in the Warhammer world, as well as the gifts it may dispose on its most devout of followers. But before we get ahead of ourselves, the feasts had in the tribes are beyond the banquets and balls seen amongst the lands of men, elf, or even Dawi, as the ogres are known to have feasts that can last literal weeks. All the while, fresh meat is consumed in mass quantities. Deadly games are played and acts of violence and challenge are commonplace, most of which are held in a pit dug deep into the earth in reverence of the Great Maw where offerings of food, weapons, and armor, and fresh blood and death are given freely by members of the tribe. It is during these feasts that the most challenges for Tyrant are made, and many aspects of Ogre society are brought to the forefront. Chief amongst them being that the Tyrant and his iron guts are afforded the largest and best cuts of meat prepared by the butchers of the tribe, which act similarly to a priest to many other races. In addition to the festivities of food, drink, and violence, the bellower of the tribe is taxed with marking this sacred occasion with a form of psalm, which is not exactly the right word, as ogres are not known for their artistic acumen, and pleasing sound to an ogre is simply loud, hence the name bellower as this ogre is the loudest at shouting out challenges and tales of the tribe to his fellows to mark this feast. The feasts are truly a sight not many outside of the tribes have seen, or should I say survived, and there's even a further feast known as the actual Great Feast, which is called by the Overtyrant, the leader of all the tribes. 
it is required to be attended by all the tyrants and representatives of the tribes of the kingdoms, whom drag their greatest kills their tribe has to offer before the over-tyrant, as well as the tribe's maw-tooth, a great piece of bone, either sculpted or pulled from a beast that represents one of the massive tooths of the great maw itself. All of which are gathered around the maw pit at the great feast to mark the occasion and dedicate it to their hungry god. It is seen as a great honor to not only attend this feast, but also be allowed to drag the maw tooth to this week long and sometimes month long event where loyal tribes are showered with gifts, while disallowed, loyal, or treacherous tribes are dealt with in a more bloody and spectacular fashion. But before we move on, we should definitely discuss the butchers themselves, the de facto priests for the Great Maw, and spiritual leaders of the Ogre tribes. Butchers are second only to the tyrant when it comes to importance in the tribe. They are responsible for preparing the feasts and offering guidance to the tribes as they represent the Maw themselves. For the most part, butchers are far more rotund than your average ogre, and they are the only ogres you will find not wearing a gut plate, as their faith in the Great Maw will protect them from harm, or so they believe. In addition to this bold show of faith, butchers also have an assortment of crude and effective cooking utensils at the ready. These range from cleavers wielded in battle to hooks of meat and other ingredients dangling from their own flesh, or large tenderizers and pouches of seasoning tucked into their filthy aprons. And by and far, an ogre butcher is the most filthy of its tribe, which is saying something, as ogre hygiene is not exactly high on a priority list. It is not uncommon for butchers to wallow in blood and meat just for the sake of it, as if perhaps this act may bring them closer to understanding the maw and its will. For a butcher must always be ready for the will of the maw, hence why they carry their utensils at all times. Which is another reason why they are both revered and feared in the camp, as it is not uncommon for a butcher to... Add some select ingredients from perhaps another ogre that got just a little too close before a feast. They are also responsible for the well-being of the tribe and to make sure it stays strong through both food and birthings. This is done in a very Spartan fashion, as newborns, not seen as being large or strong enough, are given to the butcher to deliver to the maw as an offering. The babe is thrown into a nearby hole akin to the maw and covered with a large stone. Some of these children, despite this treatment, survive this very vicious and testing trial and become gorgers. But that is a story for another time. Now, butchers, being almost like shamans, are not learned conduits such as you might find in many other races of the warmer world. They would not be considered wizards, though they do have the ability to summon and channel magic in the form of gut magic, which is more akin to a holy miracle of the man-god Sigmar than that of a sorcerer. For this reason, the, the position of shaman is not passed down through inheritance. In fact, there are no examples of a if a butcher is even allowed to uh, reproduce. But much like these shamanistic societies in our own world, when a child is born into the tribe, they may have the look or potential to become a butcher. He is handed over to the shaman and is bitten across the belly to mark him as his own, then trained to be the next shaman once he has passed into the oblivion of the maw. This process is both dangerous and violent, as the protege must ingest literal poison rancid meats, and diseased carcasses to be capable of wielding the blessings of the maw. And those blessings come in the form of the aforementioned gut magic. This branch of magic, which is very specific to the ogre kingdoms, is unique in that it requires certain components and rituals to be taken immediately for there to be any effect. You can almost compare it to some interpretation of 
voodoo, or maybe a more violent and bloody interpretation of Native American shamans. Regardless, a sacrifice must be made. This can come in the form of eating the brains of a prepared head during the battle, which then, with the Maul's blessings, will rack his enemies with fear and cripple them with nightmares. Or perhaps ripping the spinal column from a falling foe and consuming the blood and marrow to empower himself and his nearby allies with powers as his body acts as a conduit for the Great Maw itself. Of course, this does not come without risks, as it has been known for a subpar offering or lacking zeal of a butcher to be consumed by the very power he is called upon, as the maw will split open from his belly and devour him whole, or perhaps his simple organ, his head will explode as the nightmares he attempts to cast turn back on himself, overloping the simple organ and rupturing it across his companions. Much like any magic in Warhammer, it has great risks associated with it. But when everything goes right, an ogre butcher is terrifying and devastating force on the battlefield. Where they intend to be front and center, collecting fresh ingredients with every swing of their cleavers and dedicating the deaths and the imbibement of flesh to the Great Maw. However, there is one further aspect of gut magic we have not yet discussed, which are the blessings of the fire bellies by the only other deity of the ogre pantheon, the fire mouth. The fire mouth is essentially a massive volcano near the center of the mountains of Morn, the current homeland of the ogre kingdoms. Much like the maw, it is given great reverence as when it erupts, the destruction and power is awe-inspiring to the ogres who have seen it which eventually gave rise to the Fire Mouth, supposed offspring of the Great Maw and the Sun. It is a god of fire and war, its eruptions representing the time for violence and the ever-flowing magma the need to spread and destroy as its most devout followers attempt to emulate. While the Fire Mouth does not have a great a following as the Maw, it does have its own priests known as Fire Bellies, Unlike butchers, fire bellies all come from a single tribe that is located in caves near the fire mouth itself. Ogres live and serve in the tribe, learning the secrets and power of the fire mouth before setting out and joining other tribes or simply traveling abroad, spreading the word of their destructive god. However, they always seem to return eventually. Many years have probably passed and they had come with a tow of prospect ogres willing to make the pilgrimage to the fire mouth. And this cycle repeats itself again and again and again. And unlike the trials of the butcher, we actually have a rather in-depth description of what it requires to become a firebelly priest. And it is quite horrifying. The trial by fire, as it is known, begins when an ogre whom felt the pull of the fire mouth and made the pilgrimage to the tribe are tasked with first consuming an entire cauldron of flame toad and devil pepper curry in one sitting, a mixture that is said to have ended several protracted sieges. He must then catch one of the cart horse sized fire beetles that burrow through the lava streams and eat that in one sitting as well. However, the final task is the most perilous, as the ogre must drink the blood of the fire mouth itself. To do so, the prospect is lowered into the volcano to the bubbling surface of the fire mouth. At this point, most ogres attempt to flee, but the truly zealous continue as their flesh is burned, all their hair is stripped from their body, and their eyes begin to melt in their sockets. They scoop up a skullful of magma, and once pulled back up, must drink it all. This act has killed more than its fair share of prospects, and only those truly blessed by the fire mouth live through this, and are blessed with the god's powers. Their empty sockets are filled with the wrath of the fire mouth, and they are able to see once again. Their skin glows from within. 
They're heavily tattooed in symbols of destruction, and thus another fire belly is born. The fire bellies can essentially wield the wind of Ashi, or if I'm saying that properly, it is the lore of fire. Though they must still do so in a similar fashion to how the butchers commune with the Maw, by ingesting offerings and making sacrifices to deliver the wrath of the fire mouth upon their enemies. And with that very tantalizing look into the religion and magic wielded by the Odegar kingdoms, I'm going to end this lore video as there is not much else for us me to discuss. They only have two deities. But before I go, please do make sure to both like this video and subscribe to the channel if you have not, as lately the YouTube algorithm has been, uh, let's just say touchy. You would be doing me a great favor. Now, I hope that you learned something new or perhaps were refreshed for some knowledge you already may have had by um, watching this video. But I am a simple, small, weak man, and unlike a mighty tyrant, I have made mistakes. And if I have made one, or you would simply just like to ask a question, do leave me a comment down in the comment section, and I will do my best to either answer your question to the best of my abilities, use it in an upcoming lore video, or one of my many Q&As. If you like the Ogres and Warhammer in general, make sure to check out my fantasy roleplay on the channel, The Rise of the Forsaken Campaign. Um, it has had its few share of ogres already in it as well. And, of course, I would like to thank all of you for watching. I have been Jumbo Thick. Thank you once again. And I hope to see you soon in my next video. Have a good day.